lot of hard but a war can serve a focus a lot now in those three conflicts the rising the war of independence and the civil war so a lot of these men and women will visit they all have that one thing in common most of them were active in all three conflicts throughout their lives same with this man he's buried just beside us so Eamon de Valera is buried here today uh, people come up to the grave and they often ask why is his headstone very modest and very small because they know the history of Eamon de Valera a former 1916 leader president Taoiseach like a prime minister big political figure from our history there is a reason why the headstone is quite modest I mentioned that at the end so he's born in America his name is just down the bottom 1882 people ask about his background well he's kind of a mixed background a Spanish or Cuban father and an Irish mother so he's born in Manhattan by 1882 but about two or three years later his Spanish or Cuban father passed away so his mother Catherine decided his upbringing and his education will be Ireland she was from County Limerick originally so Eamon de Valeria arrives in Ireland at the age of three. His grandmother, his uncle, members of his family rally around him and they look after him. But of course, Eamon de Valeria spent a lot of time with one thing, education. He's a very intelligent young man, but he put so much time and energy into his schooling. And as he got older, when he graduates, he became a professor in mathematics. But also he's a big interest in the Irish language and the Irish culture. So by 1908, you can imagine if you joined the Gaelic League, joined this organization for a couple of reasons. Revived the sport, the music, the language, the history, but of course, everything to do with had this big Celtic revival, anything you can think of that remembers the past and the Gaelic past in Ireland. That's your objective, you have to revive it. But Sinead, that lady's name you see in the headstone, she was a member of the organization. A fluent Irish speaker taught Eamon how to speak the language fluently, and then they're married by 1910. But many members of the Gaelic League, about 80% of them became involved in the rising. So a lot of them were recruited through the Gaelic League to fight in that rising, and De Valera is no different. So there he is in his volunteer uniform. He is a leader of the rising, stationed at Bowden's Mill. So the Bowden's Mill garrison is where De Valera was. He's the last leader to surrender, and he held his position for six and a half days. His men conflicted the heaviest casualties on the British forces during the rising in one single day. So on the 26th of April 1916, the Sherwood Forester Regiment arrived in from England. They're standing in Dunleary. Some of them are speaking French because they think they're in Cherbourg and fighting the First World War. So they're looking around going, where are we? Is this not Cherbourg? As a matter of fact, it's Dublin. Other members of the Sherwood Forester Regiment, well, they've been shown how to use a rifle for the first time. So there they are loading a rifle and shown how to use it. They're totally unprepared for the rising. As they begin to march into Dublin, they're marching down Northumberland Road, Mount Street Bridge. Members of De Valera's volunteers open fire. 80 are killed. In total, there's over 200 casualties for the British forces on one single day. So from a British perspective, it's a disaster. It's a huge loss of life. For De Valera and his volunteers, it's the opposite. It's a huge victory. Nevertheless, he does surrender. So that photograph down the bottom is De Valera in the middle at Richmond Barracks in Dublin and the Sherwood Foresters either side of him. He's not executed. So when he was brought to Comanum Jail, like 14 men were executed within Comanum. De Valera is not one. You can decide why. Because many people say, well, in total, following your rising, there were 16 leaders executed, 14 within Comanum. De Valera was a leader. But we often say, well, there's two possibilities why he's spared. You can say citizenship was one. He's born an American, so technically an American. If you're the British government, you're fighting the First World War. You're in negotiations with America to become your ally. So the last thing you're going to do is execute an American citizen. The second theory is public outcry. So imagine 16 men are literally catapulted into Irish history books. I mean, now they're martyrs, they're patriots, they're heroes to many people in Ireland. So the British government said, well, if you continue executing these leaders, there's more martyrs, there's more public outcry, there's another risk of a rebellion. So Eamon de Valera spared execution either for one of those reasons. By 1919, the War of Independence began. Later on, you'll visit the mastermind of it, Michael Collins. And that lasted to 1921. You need money, you need weapons, you need support. So Eamon de Valera was responsible for a lot of this in America. So he fundraised a huge amount of money in America, organises gun running campaigns and gathers support amongst Irish Americans. Some even left America who'd emigrated there to come back to become active in this war of independence. So as Michael Collins said, without all three, he couldn't successfully organise that war of independence. And thanks to Eamon de Valera, he had a huge role to play in it, but it's outside Ireland for most of it. But unfortunately, following the Irish War of Independence and the truce of 1921, we fight a brutal civil war. So there's a lot of men and women here who took up opposing sides during the Irish Civil War, pro or anti-treaty. So the foundation of the Civil War, how can you summarize it? Well, 
the Angle Wires Treaty. It's very slim, similar to Home Rule. So the British government offered Ireland a measure of independence with a 26 county free state, our own parliament and a peace agreement. So many people say, yeah, it is quite similar to Home Rule. And a lot of people in Ireland support the treaty. As Michael Collins said, well, after 700 years, our own government with a 26 county free state and a peace agreement, we can use that to achieve a united Ireland peacefully. So a lot of men and women accept it. If you're aiming Countess Markovic, Cahill Brewer, just to name a few, they reject the treaty for two reasons. Partition, so the northern half of the country, Northern Ireland, remains a part of Britain. And of course, the likes of the Oath of Allegiance that will have to be taken. So if you became a member of the Irish Parliament, you'll have to take an Oath of Allegiance to the British Crown. So for De Valera and Markovic, they've seen the free state is not enough. We're still a member of the British Empire. We may have our own government, but we're not swearing an oath. We're not accepting partition. Behind that tree line over there, just behind it, is Arthur Griffith. Griffith negotiated the treaty with Collins, and he too seen it as a stepping stone to United Ireland, but to be done peacefully. Six months after that treaty was negotiated, we fight a bitter civil war. It was a horrible conflict that lasted just about a year. Finally, to uh, summarise Eamon de Valeri in politics, like, to be honest, we could be here for hours. The best way of summarising it is, well, in 1926, himself and Countess Markovic formed a political party we still have today, and that's Fianna Fáil. So he's a co-founder of Fianna Fáil. He went on then to lead Ireland as a Taoiseach or Prime Minister three times, and then President of our country twice. So if you're President of Ireland twice, Taoiseach three times, helped to form a political party, and was politically active for most of his life, course going to have a massive role in shaping Ireland's history. He passes away then in 1970. So you can see here, Eamon and Sinead, by 1975, husband and wife have passed away. It's quite a large family plot, so there's different members of the De Valera family buried here, including children. This name, Brian, that is the reason why the headstone is quite small. He died in the Phoenix Park, he was a young man, it was a horse riding accident. He was buried here first and Sinead chose his headstone. She said it was a fitting nice simple monument to their young son and Eamon said I agree if it's good enough for Brian it's good enough for everybody so that's why the headstone is quite modest just in memory of their young son so that kind of summarizes Eamon's Evil era he'll crop up every now and again as we walk around the cemetery when we visit other people if you want to photograph beside himself or any of the other men and women we visit feel free to ask it's absolutely no problem or just step up here and take a photograph if you wish that's fine if you are just watch the curbstones don't trip and fall but he composed beside the monuments, no problem.